This morning's message is the conclusion of the four Sundays that we have looked at our membership vows. That when you join a Methodist church, and you pledge to support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. So as you can, you're all smart people, you figure out this one has to do with service. I don't think you'd be in church if you needed convincing that your faith better put some feet to your prayers. So this, I won't focus on that today. If I thought I needed to, to convince you to serve, I might have to wonder if you're truly saved. But paying forward, because certainly if, if you're familiar with the term, and if you're not, that's okay. It just means you're Megan and you don't go to movies. She's being distracted by Rowan, so she doesn't know that I just mentioned her. <laughs> yes, I mentioned that Megan doesn't watch movies. So, so that was a movie a few years back that dealt with a man who had been blessed, and then he blessed somebody else. That's what the term means. It means you get a, something good, and instead of saying thanks to the person who gave it to you, you want to show your thanks by... Blessing someone else. That's paying forward. So for those of you, as I said, who aren't with it, hip cats with the culture. <laughs> you like my Fred Flintstone dance? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not here, as I said, to convince you that you should be serving, but maybe to reflect on how you are serving because we're busy, right? All of us are busy. One of the things that I have tried to, one of the phrases I have tried to stricken from my own vocabulary is, I didn't have time. If I ever use that as, a, and as an excuse to you, please call me on it. Because, truth is, I always have time to do what I want to do. I always seem to have time to check my hog traps. But I may not always have time to do a good thing or the right thing. And that is kind of where I'm going with this message. We have many, many things competing for our time. And let's face it, until we battle or win the clock, we're not going to be able to serve. Because service takes time. It is easier, it's interesting, we're going to have the Billy Graham Association is coming to Del Rio and they're going to have our church and the Ministerial Alliance participate as part of that process. And the man that called me with the initial invitation to be part of this says, does your church have a discipleship program? I was going to go down a different lane with this man. I wanted to, to be a Christian when I answered him. So I just kind of gave him my short answer, which was, we're a church. Because I sometimes suspect that parachurch organizations, when I talk to the people, I'm like, do you go to church? Because you don't act like you know what a church does. But I got it that he says some churches don't have discipleship programs particularly for new believers, and I get that. To disciple a new believer takes a lot of time. You have to, if, you're, if you feel called to disciple that new believer, you're going to have to scratch a whole bunch of things off your, off your clock because this new believer, well, let's put it, without putting too fine a point on it, before they became a believer, they belonged to the devil, Right? And the devil didn't need to attack them. Their own habits were bad enough. <laughs> and they already belonged to him. When they give their life to Christ, they now have an enemy. The same enemy that killed Christ is now this new believer's enemy. So they're going to have problems they never imagined before. And if God has called you to serve this new believer, they're going to be calling you at 3 in the morning. You're going to end up driving them places. You're going to end up having to get their car. and so, There's just going to be a whole range of things as this person comes under attack. And you're going to want to say, you know, maybe that's not how I want to serve the Lord with new believers. So many churches get out of the business of new believers because it takes a lot of time. 
there's a lot of pain forward for, for your own salvation. I mean, you have received this great gift of salvation, but to pay that forward to a new believer is hard, hard work and time-consuming. That is why I'm sure that the prophet Isaiah, he is saying, it's commanding the nation to say, well, first of all, we have to begin the basics. I love he says, <laughs> the finger pointing. <laughs> Stop the finger pointing. Stop gossiping. And then now this call to serve. Spend yourself. And I'm, I'm, I love that it's in a monetary sense. Spend yourself for the hungry. We might, in that sense, be talking about the food insecure. I love the euphemisms we live in now in the 21st century. Food insecure, what the heck does that mean? And there's a sermon or two on that, and I usually would let Glenda give that. <laughs> if you don't know, Glenda is a political animal, and she will give you a sermon on something like that in a moment's notice. No preparation needed. But anyhow, it may be someone who is actually hungry, though I suspect that in our land and all of the resources we have in Uvalde, probably that's not the hungry God's talking about. What are the hungers out there? I'll just give you a couple because you'd like to be done at some point today. It's amazing how much good parenting, the hunger for good parenting is in the land. So many men that are mass shooters and things like that, they suffer from the father wound. I know this isn't a term we're bandying around right now. It's a term from the 90s. But I can tell you that as a pastor, I encounter this in young men all the time. And even in old men. I marvel that Ted Turner... A man who's a billionaire suffers from this wound. His dad never told him that he was proud of him. And you can make all the billions in the world, and if you haven't received that blessing, you're going to be wounded your whole life. And guess what? You're going to take, it's going to take the church time to convince you that you can't keep trying to fix that father wound. It's going to take some parenting. And then another problem that's out there is so few girls... Their dad's just not present. Even if their dad stays married to mom, if dad is not present in the girl's life, it will show in how she dresses. It will show in the ink on her skin. It will show in piercings, all kinds of things. So if you want to serve God, dads, be there for your daughter. Don't chase after riches. If you want to spend yourself with the hungry, your daughter is hungry. Your granddaughter is hungry and needs that. And then that will, it's interesting, Isaiah 58 says, in our dark times, our times where we're having trouble people staying married, it will really shine like a light. So if you don't have children, at least work on your marriage if you have children, work on your marriage. I knew that if I didn't want my daughters to marry a jerk, I had to not be a jerk to Glenda. And it's taken 40 years, but she's working on me. <laughs> Girls, the part of the reason God has the dad give away the daughter at the marriage ceremony is because, as it says in Numbers 31, that's the transition of power or not power, but of authority, spiritual protection. All of these things get passed at that point. So girls always, and, and not in an unhealthy way, they marry their dad. Whoever their dad was, that's what they think love looks like. And they marry a man that loves, and you know, if there are five love languages, whatever dad's love language is, that's who they'll marry. So dad, you gotta really pay it forward. If you want your family, your legacy, You've got to pay at that time. And then your light will shine in the darkness. I've focused on family because often that's where we have to do our ministry. Right now, Glenda and I are in that season where both of our moms are losing their mind. We thought they'd lost them when we were teenagers. That was self-inflicted. But right now, they're having the signs of age. And it is taking... 
resolution from Glenda and I to resolve to, in Exodus 20, honor our fathers and our mothers in this time when they are calling at weird times, saying things such as the other day Glenda's mom called to say, there's a wedding at the church, we got to go right now. And Glenda had to convince her father that reason was not going to work, that the best thing that Floyd could do for his wife was to put on his best suit as she was putting on her best clothes and go down to the church to show that it was locked up. There was no wedding going on. He couldn't convince her any other way than to take her to that building. Sometimes that is how you pay it forward. You honor your father and your mother even when it doesn't make sense. You have to do this thing. I told you, church, that I'm pretty sure you know you've got to serve. I'm just saying it may mean that you have to shift your priorities around. And you should have to shift priorities around because you are, you're not just Americans, you're the best kind of Americans, and what is that? Texans, yes. Okay, if you didn't go there, it means you probably well, you weren't born south of the Red River. <laughs> I, 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 got, I got reminded how foreign I was yesterday as I, I, I have a, another service, and it's up north of this town that I mispronounced. I, unfortunately, I had taken Spanish in high school, so I knew how to say Blanco, except I didn't know how to say it in Texan. <laughs> Anyhow, the best kind of American, I digress, you don't want to get home. The best kind of Americans are Texans, and so you have been richly blessed just by being born in Texas, right? Okay. So in Hebrews 6, God uses the analogy of the fields, and, and, and we so understand it in this drought. And he says, you know, if you had two fields, and they both got rain on them, and one produced the crop that was planted in it, and the other produced kind of weeds, random weeds, or what's the other, that weed, it's a, it's a euphemism for random. And it, it'll come to me as soon as I'm out of here. But anyhow, there's a kind of weed that's in all the fields now. If this land, if one produces the crop and the other produces weeds, it says God will actually bless that land. And you can tell from this inclusion of this metaphor in Hebrews 6 that it's meant for the church to say, if that's the case in land, where if land will get a blessing for producing that for which it was purposed, how much more so the church? And if a field that is supposed to produce good things doesn't, it'll get burned, how much more so human beings? If God blesses them and it just all stays with them and they don't pay it forward, how much more so? Of course, in Hebrews 6, as I'll say now, I know that would never be you guys. Okay, that's not exactly the wording of Hebrews 6, but it says, we believe better things for you. But it is this thing, you've received tremendous blessings. You're Texans, you're Christians, you're in church. You have clothes on, this building has electricity and therefore air conditioning and all of these things. And you are surrounded, you live in a community that I know because they come in here Monday through Friday not having those things, not having those blessings. And, and yet they live here. How could we not expend ourselves and pay into them? We're reminded in Hebrews 6 that God is not unjust. He is a just God. And it says, he will remember how you sir loved him by serving your brothers and sisters. So if you say you love God, you've got to be paying it forward. You've got to change your schedule. If you look around and say, I really haven't made intentional time to serve my God, you've got to clear something out. Find some window in there because God says, that's how you love me, as you serve the brothers and sisters. I think you're smart enough to get it, so I won't say any more, but just to say as we go into this year that is ahead of us, we must be thinking and intentionally paying it forward. 
we have received so much from God. And the way that you thank God is you bless others. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for all you give us, and it's undeserved. There's no way that we could ever earn all the blessings that we have received. But you are a loving Father, and you just desire to bless your children, and you have blessed us. We're not waiting for that blessing. It is already present. It is in our hands and in our life and in our family. Let us then share these gifts with others who are hungry, who are oppressed, who lack those things, who live in this time of darkness. May our light shine to the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.